Japanese to study motors. And in fact, we'll walk down the hall for one moment here. So you get more about have, pushing buttons in case you launch a weapon. To, to build on what John said, I am such a good instructor, I have visual aids. Come on down. So, this is in 1926. This is Harold Edgerton. And these are the motors he's trying to understand. He's doing his graduate work at understanding what happens to a motor in a factory spinning if there's a change in the electrical condition. So here's a motor turning and lightning hits the power line. What does the motor do? And he does lots of equations. And, they, and MIT says, wow, nice equations. Here's a master's degree. And he goes into the lab, and he's working, and he comes across an early, very primitive strobe, electronic flash, and he discovers he can use that to see what's going on with his motors. The, the response is very fast, but the strobe can capture this. And the story is he showed his wife the 300th photo of a synchronous motor. And she said, Harold, can't you take a picture of something a little more interesting? And he went back to the laboratory, and he turned the water on in the sink, and he set up his camera, well, maybe he set up the camera and strobe, and then turned the water on, and it flash, and he took a flash photo of water coming out of the faucet, and he discovered there are things in the world even more interesting than synchronous motors. <laughs> and so he went off to take pictures of these more interesting things. For example, a football being kicked is one of his more interesting things. Uh, this was a very early, early shot. We know it's an early shot for a couple reasons, several reasons. One is somewhere we have the date in the 1930s. Another reason is only a small area is illuminated, so it was an early strobe. It's black and white, not color. And of course, if you look at the footwear, this is not modern footwear. Right? <laughs> there are two things I find interesting about this photo. And the first thing I want to point out to you is right here, there's a wire on the back of the football. And why is there a wire on the back of the football? Trigger the uh, strobe? Exactly. I think there's a second wire. And as the football begins to move, you can see it's moved a little. Two wires contacted, and that set off the strobe. <laughs> the other thing I love, though, is if you look right here above the strobe, it's like a ghost almost. Yeah. Right? You can see the curve of the football. What's going on there? Uh, pressure. Okay, so if there was some other light going on, it could be some time lapse, but then I would expect to see more than just that tiny little arc. I'd expect to see more of the football. It is dust. When you kick the football, the football moves, but the dust stays. And the dust is hanging in space as the football has moved out from under it. It has not been long enough for the dust to really fall yet. Huh. Give it a little longer, and it will. Right? <laughs> and so um, he ended up spending his career working with strobes and imaging. Uh, during Shortly before World War II, he was visited by a fellow from the United States Army Air Corps, now known as the Air Force. And this fellow said, he said, do you make those bright flashes? And Edgerton said, yeah. And this guy from the Army Air Corps said, can you make a flash, an electronic strobe, that we could put in an airplane and at night take a picture of the ground from 5,000 feet, from one mile over the ground. And Edgerton did some calculations, said, yeah, it'll weigh two tons. And my understanding is he said it would weigh two tons, in part because it would weigh two, two tons, but also because he figured that would scare off this crazy guy. What the crazy guy knew, of course, was that uh, the Boeing was making the B-17 bomber among other aircraft, and two tons really was not that much to carry anymore, right? And so that's what Edgerton did during World War II. He designed into his team, they built strobes that were used for aerial reconnaissance at night. Um, this was important because before these strobes, if you wanted to take a photo of the ground at night, and, and of course, you know, the Germans were very good at, you know, and the Japanese, they were good, and they would like to drive their tanks around at night when it would be hard to see them. It was very smart. Right? And if you wanted to take pictures of the ground at night, what you did was you had an airplane that dropped what was known as a magnesium bomb. It would flare, and it would burn, and it would glow, and it would be bright for some time. And the problem with that is, if you have this airplane and you drop the bomb, and now it's bright and it's throwing light all over the ground, if you try to take a picture from this airplane, you see this big, bright, glowing mass of magnesium. So to take the picture, you need a second airplane lower than the bomb than the flare. 
Oh. And of course, if you're the anti-aircraft gunner on the ground, right. the sky gets very bright, and now there's an airplane easy to see between you and the light source. Right. Nobody liked to fly the lower aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> but once you put the strobe in the body of the plane taking the photos, life got much better. Right? And they were used, um, their photos in the archives uh, that were given to Edgerton by the Army, I assume, you know, photos of France within a week of the DA invasions. And it was very, you know, very helpful there. Mm -hmm. uh, after the war, he also got into underwater work, and I'll show you that in a minute, but he was a fixture of MIT. And if we put the three photos back here, okay, you know, he's hanging out with students, and uh, you see he had a guitar, and he'd pull out the guitar, and he'd get everyone to sing along. Um, I particularly like this photo here where he's got the, the paper hats, and as I recall, it was... I mean, I, okay, I'll tell you, I hear a hum yes, that goes... That's a, yeah, it's an arc, so what yeah. I'm hearing is... Mm, it's not changing pitch. It's not going... Mm, You're mm. building Frankenstein. I am. <laughs> well, it is. You see it in the Frankenstein movies. It's an arc. So what we've done here is we take the, eight, the power from the wall, 110 volts AC, and this is the US, so it's going, the electricity is going back and forth 60 times a second. Mm -hmm. We have a transformer to make the voltage much bigger, and we apply the voltage at the base of these two long metal rods. And what happens is we get an arc. The electricity jumps from one rod to another, just like in the winter if you scuff yeah. your feet on the carpet and you reach up yeah. to the it doorknob and you get a spark. Yeah. We, yeah. we planned it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> And are the rods further apart at the top compared to the bottom? So, so the arc starts at the bottom because they're closest together and it's easiest for the electricity yeah. to jump a small gap. But when the electricity jumps across, it's dissipating a lot of energy and it heats up the gap light that you see. Did you get that or are you more confused now? Uh, kind of. It's, it's no. I just wanted to know what does it mean when it says wave your fingers? Oh, very good. Okay. Let me finish this and we'll try this. You get an arc of electricity.